so I'm not sure how to start this video. Sonic Generations is, as the title suggests, a very special game for me. It's the game that introduces me to the Sonic franchise, it pays tribute to the entire Sonic franchise, and has a shamelessly reaction classic Sonic assets for the 256th time, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Of course, because this is one of the first games I've ever played, I'm not gonna lie, I'm sort of biased. So, no matter how hard I try to separate myself from my biases, they exist and I can't really control it. Now, with that out of the way, this is my review of Sonic Generations. I assume I should talk about the development first. So basically it started in 2009 when Sonic Team wanted to combine all of the best elements of Sonic from the past to create the 20th anniversary game, that's all I really need to say honestly. Not sure how I will transition to this, so let's just get into the worst aspect of the game, the story. So basically there's this thing called the Time Eater and it's like Sonic and all of his friends and also the classic Sonic and also classic Tails. And oh man, the story is so forgettable. Long story short, basically the two gather the Chaos Emerald, which of the bosses own somehow, and then uh, beat the Time Eater. Now and also save his friends along the way by completing stages. I don't think the story of this game is terrible, but it is underwhelming that an anniversary game basically have no story. Still prefer it over something like Lost World though. That said, I'd like to discuss Classic Sonic now. If you have been around in the Sonic fandom for a while, you'd know that he's a bit controversial. Splitting Sonic into two characters is a move that a lot of people do not like. What it does is only split the fanbase even more. However, to me personally, I'm fine with this if it were a one-time thing. But obviously, that isn't the case. But that's a story for another day. What I'm getting at here is that at the time it worked, and may I remind you that it wasn't really a separate character until this abomination came out. Alright, with that out of the way, it's time to talk about the presentation, and I think it's nice. The graphics looks nice for a 7th gen game in 2011, and looks even greater on the PC version with increased resolution and frame rate. This is the second game that uses the Hedgehog engine, and it looks nice. Unleash may have some higher looking textures, I think. However, some of them look muddy, and it also runs a very inconsistent frame rate and a sub native resolution. I grew up with the 360 version, but for this video I'm playing the PC version, and it is such a privilege to play a game that you're used to seeing at 720p 30fps. Now at 1080p 60fps. The worst part of this game's presentation, in my opinion, is a lackluster cutscene animation. They just look so stiff and unnatural, but I digress. Also, the cutscene runs at 480p on PC and 360, it looks really pixelated, especially on the 360. The PS3 has the best looking cutscenes, but also has the longest load speed. So pick your poison if you want to play it console, although I highly recommend just getting the PC version if you can. Now let's talk about the soundtrack. Most of it is of course remixes, and while a lot of people have said that this game basically just cheats with the soundtrack, I disagree. Remixing a song ain't easy folks, and they did a nice job here. The only track I don't like here is Planet Plus Black 1 scene. It just sounds weird. Whoa, and we're all 
already at the gameplay. That was faster than the colors reveal. Okay then, first off, obviously, Classic Sonic. Obviously, it aims to emulate the Classic game. Now, one year right after- Nope, nope, never mind, that game doesn't exist. It has of course been a while since Sonic Team made Tree and Knuckles, and their engines have of course changed, so it's obviously not a one-to-one -one replication. But does it still control well? Well, you've probably heard of this before, but it kinda controls like Adventure Sonic in 2D. I don't think it's as good as the Genesis game or the Adventure game, but I think it gets the job done. Especially when it's compared to Sonic Forces. Yeah, it's fine. Jump feels fine, spin dash is OP, and the biggest difference is probably that you don't gain speed while rolling downhill. And yeah, while I don't like that, at least there's some sort of physics instead of this thing. Before we get to the level design, let's talk about the controls for Modern Sonic. While not the best Sonic I've ever controlled, it was definitely the best boost Sonic I've ever controlled. The movement ain't the best, but it still feels less stiff than Sonic Colors, or Wii PS2 Unleashed, and less slippery than the 360 PS3 Unleashed. You can actually turn comfortably now. You can run without boosting without feeling like you're about to get hit seconds later. Now let's talk about the other abilities of Modern Sonic. The homing attack works as expected, the quick step and drift are actually useful now instead of being relegated to specific sections of the game or just being unreliable, and the trick section is okay I guess. In Unleash, these sections are QTEs which not everyone likes, although I personally don't mind, unless we're talking about the super strict one. In Colors, these are mindless button mash. In Generations, these are basically how many boost energy can you get before the time runs out. They certainly aren't the most challenging thing in the world, but they're not bad. And also, you get less energy if you just repeatedly hold the same direction. Okay, so there are 9 stages in Sonic Generation. Of course, each stage has 2 acts, each averaging from 2 to 4 minutes, thank god. One for Classic, and one for Modern. The stages returning here are... For the Classic era, we have Green Hill from Sonic 1, Chemical Plant from Sonic 2, and Sky Sanctuary from Sonic and Knuckles. For the Dreamcast era, we have Speed Highway from Sonic Adventure, City Escape from Sonic Adventure 2, and Seaside Hill from Sonic Heroes. I'm not gonna question Sonic Heroes being here because, well, just because it's called the Dreamcast era doesn't really mean everything should be from the Dreamcast. For the modern era, we have Crisis City from Sonic 06, Rooftop Run from Sonic Unleashed, and Planet Lift from Sonic Colors. A lot of people have been confused about Crisis City being in Generations considering that the events of the game was erased, so the only explanation I can think of is that the Time Eater can travel between multiple timelines and bring back things that is already erased from the timeline. I don't know, point is they should have given an explanation to this. Now I'd say that I'm a bit mixed on the stage selected, I'm not talking about Green Hill because despite being so overused to the point that I see it more than the sky at this point, it makes sense for the time, but for city levels, no using that's a bit overkill. I do know that the stages were chosen by fans back then. Okay, this is the part where I just put some stage selections in the screens, but after looking back at it, I think it's kind. That stage order is also not the best, because I I don't want to just say the stage order is bad and just move on, but I also kind of feel that the stage order that I, that I presented is not the best, because I just feel bad to just, you know, say that it's bad and not offering any suggestions and act like I know better because I don't. These game designers are obviously smarter than me. But yeah. The 3DS version had better stage selection and that's all I'm gonna say. I'll review the 3DS version later. So uh, yeah, back to the scripted video. Alright, now it's finally time to talk about level design. And this game basically contains every single thing I want out of Sonic game. Speed, thrill, fun platforming, fun and memorable set pieces, but let's go more in depth than that. First off, let's talk about the first stage, Green Hill. For both Sonics, this teaches you all the basic movesets, without making you feel like you're on autopilot all the time. Starting off with the one for a classic Sonic. 
You, of course, have to go to the right, but there are actually things going on. Enemies, platforms, and shortcuts. It is the easiest and shortest level, and it can even be completed in a minute, but it does a great job teaching the player about all the stuff that they need to know. Next up, let's talk about the one for Modern Sonic. Simply put, it's everything that Lost Valley should have done. Instead of starting you with 12 seconds of straight line, right from the get-go, you're taught about the jump and homing attack. This teaches you the mechanics very well without feeling too hard for a first stage, nor too easy. And of course, the multiple routes. Can't forget about that. Right from the beginning, you can either just go straight to the right where you'll either go to an incline and do some jump, or you can then jump and go to the grind rails, or you can jump and then go to a trick ring, and then homing attack a bunch of enemies, and then slide. This is the type of level design I love in a Sonic game. It rewards skillful play and curiosity. Let's talk about another classic Sonic level, this time Crisis City. Speed these rails of course, you can spin dash real quick and go real fast if you have enough skill. Current platforming is of course the well fun and challenging platforming with a bunch of hazards that never feel unfair. And the memorable set piece is of course the tornado. This can suck you in real quick when it's active and it can also push both you and the platform. It's Stereographed well, it's a fun gimmick, and it doesn't overstay its welcome. One thing I also like is the way this stage handles alternate pathways. The way you access it is by carefully jumping on multiple enemies so that you won't fall off. You can also try to spin dash, but you'll most likely overshoot it. And yes, while these are somewhat easier with some of the skills, I'll talk about those later, it's still challenging and a nice challenge. And now let's talk about another modern level. This time it's Speed Highway. Right at the beginning, you can boost straight ahead or you can jump to this grand rail to get returning red rings. I'll talk about those later. Or you can just go to this helicopter because why not? It's the fastest option and also of course it's the hardest one to get. And there are so many other clever shortcuts here. Like jump here to skip some sections or take the high road here. And then after you take your rocket, you can homing attack on it and then of course take another shortcut. Seriously, the stage is so good and it isn't even my favorite stage. Of course, if we talk about every single example of good level design, we'd be here all day. Now let's talk about the weakest stage for both Sonics and conveniently, it's the same stage for both Sonic. Let me introduce you to Planet Wisp. Ugh, let's talk about that one first. The best word to describe the stage is repetitive. It just used the spike was here, the spike was there, and used the spike was Oh my god. That's basically all I have to say for the stage, and to be honest, that's all the way I have to say with Rack 2. Basically, repetitive is Planet Bushman in a cell. Act 2 is first rocket with boring, slow platforming. Of course, it's time to talk about ranking system. Simply put, it's terrible. The ranks basically requires no effort at all. You do need to beat the stage without dying, but one, that's not so hard, and two, it's mainly time based. But the time limit is just so generous, it's basically non existent, so yeah, that's the ranking system in a nutshell. Now, of course, it's time to talk about the boss right? Well, before you can fight the bosses, you need to complete at least a mission from each stage to get the keys to unlock the bosses. Well, the main bosses anyway, you can fight the rivals as soon as you beat all of the stages of their respective era. But anyways, the missions can involve raising a doppelganger of yourself, which, uh, okay, or raising one of Sonic's friends, which can either be challenging or, okay? or some other fun gimmicks that change things up, whether it's changing level layout, running snowboard, working together with one of Sonic's friends, and many more. It serves as a neat distraction from the main game. You only need to complete 9 of them, but there are a total of 90. I think forcing you to play 9 is not a bad thing, and the other 90 one are a nice distraction from the main game. Of course, now it's time to talk about what I said earlier, the rival battle. First off, can I mention how there's no explanation how they got here, and where are Shadow and Silver fighting Sonic? Shadow just acts like the edgy the hedgy persona from 2005 instead of how he actually is. And Silver just asks, are you the real Sonic? Like, what? But I digress. 
the fights themselves are actually quite decent. Metal Sonic is similar to the one in Sonic CD, but actually good. He fires multiple attacks at you and of course you have to dodge them, then attack him. Although I should mention that the fight takes place at the bad future instead of the canonical good future, but I digress. Shadow is also decent, taking place in the space colony arc. You're supposed to race against Shadow to get this purple power orb thingy first, while Shadow can shoot some chaos spear. And it's a ton of fun. Final one is Silver, and surprisingly, he's actually my favorite. He uses his psychokinesis to grab objects with you, and you have to either boost or homing attack to him. And at the end, he summons a giant ball of objects to chase you. He's a ton of fun to fight. Now it's time for the main bosses. First off, the Death Egg Robot. And this is the first time that the Death Egg Robot is good. When you start, you have to wait for it to jump and then go under it to kick its butt. Or you can spin dash and then let go at the right time when he moves to go under him. After two hits or four if you're playing on hard mode, more on that later, you have to turn on these bombs and then make him aim it so that you can hit it. Repeat the process once more and then you finally beat him. Now, for the next two bosses. They're neat, I guess. Perfect Chaos is similar to the original version, but with more platforming. And Egg Ragoon is now sort of a running and chase boss fight. You basically have to run up to it and then homing attack it or use the grind rail. Or in the 2D section, wall jump. Where's the repeat and it's done. Alright, I guess now it's time to talk about the O's, so infamous final boss. After collecting all of the Chaos Emerald, six of which you can fight through bosses and one is just lying around I guess, you use the Chaos Emeralds to fix these wheels so you can finally confront Time Eater. You confront it, and then it is revealed that Dr. Eggman and his past self is controlling it. Instead of immediately fighting it, both Sonics just stand there and then this leads to exposition about Time Eater's backstory. After that, the Eggman's attacks both Sonic, which he really should have done to begin with. And then both Sonic got crushed in a pathetic attempt at being dramatic. All of Sonic's friends showed up somehow and then instead of doing something useful, they decided to just be useless cheerleader. Which, remember this, because this will be a running scene as this retrospective goes on. And then both Sonic turns into Super Sonic, which they really should have done to begin with. The Time Eater has gotten a bad rep for being one of the worst final bosses in Sonic history, and to be honest, while I do find it to be boring and repetitive, I just couldn't hate it. Call me biased and all, but while I don't consider this boss good, I don't consider it bad at all. Oh, and also Sonic's friends have the tendency to just never shut up, so that's annoying, but back to the point. Even in hard mode, I was never frustrated in this boss. Alright, let's talk about that. The hard mode basically tweaks the boss a little bit, like taking a few more hits or spawning you in a different area, and yeah, that's basically it. Nothing worthwhile, really. Alright, after the boss, you finally return back to the party. I don't know how Silver would get home, Eggman is stuck in the void, I don't know how he got out eventually, and then the game ends. After the credits, you unlock Super Sonic. In this game, you get skills from either buying them from the skill shop, beating missions, collecting red rings, or the aforementioned final boss. These are nice additions to Sonic's moveset, making them useful without making them feel like they're required. Super Sonic here though, man, it's really underwhelming. For classic Sonic, you're just invincible, I guess. But it doesn't feel faster, or the jump doesn't feel higher, unlike in the classic game. For modern Sonic, it's similar to colors except that in a lot of sections, you'll automatically fly when you boost, and when you do fly, it drains like 10 rings per second, so I basically never want to play as Super Sonic at all. Now, yes, I did mention the red rings, because yes, they are bad. Five are hidden in each stage, and just as before, they are well hidden. I don't really have much to say about them, honestly. They're basically the same as in colors. A fun side quest, and a fun excuse to explore the level. And yeah, the Sonic Generations will have some flaws here and there. I still think that this is one of the best Sonic games. I don't have much to add, honestly. I mean, you know the stuff. It's already been done to death at this point, you know, praising Generations for 
or the great level design or how it pays tribute to the entire franchise so yeah i don't really need to tell you that much but this is my retrospective and i need to talk about this game so yeah thanks for watching and i hope you enjoy the positivity of these first two videos on retrospective